Hello everyone, welcome to West Connect, connecting you with the art of data visualization and storytelling. My name is Sagar Kapoor. I'm part of customer success team at Tableau. So West Connect is your weekly Tableau community call, which helps you to inspire, get motivated and challenge yourself to participate in community sessions, learn from the Tableau Zen master, Tableau ambassadors and the champions, how you can go ahead and improve your craft in Tableau. So we have our YouTube channel. Go ahead, subscribe to it. Some great content waiting for you. We have a LinkedIn group. Go ahead, connect to each other and learn from each other. And with that, let me go ahead and introduce our speaker for today. She's a Tableau Zen master, uh, Lindsay Bessendal. So Lindsay is a Tableau Zen master and a Tableau public ambassador. She has been working in the healthcare field for over 15 years and currently a consultant design specialist at Health Data Viz, having had roles in direct clinical care, quality management, and data analytics and visualization. She has strong roots in user experience, dashboard development and design, and ensuring data insights result in action. She is a founder of Project Health Viz, a community data visualization initiative that strives to tell the stories of our health through visualization. She has a BA from Bucknell University and MA from the University of Connecticut, and currently lives in Pennsylvania with a husband and two boys. When she is not visiting, she loves hiking, snowboarding, running, cleaning, spending time with family, and drinking a good craft beer. So without further ado, Lindsay, over to you. Thanks so much, Sigar. Um, all right, let me, uh, I think you need to, there we go, perfect. All right, let's see here, and can I? All right, so thanks so much. I'm really excited to give this presentation again. I've done it a couple of times. Um, so this is my turning up the heat presentation where I share some useful and practical, hopefully practical tips that you can use in your business dashboards. Um, more recently, I've really enjoyed um, working on business dashboards, meaning the things I do at work, you know, not uh, things that I design for clients, not public facing, um, visualizations that may be uh, a little fancy or what have you. Um, but what I want to share today is that there are things that you can find in those dashboards you see on Tableau Public in your workplace that you can use today. And so I'm going to share um, my top 10 tricks that I use pretty regularly with my clients. Um, and you can follow me at Zendal Data on um, both uh, Twitter and Instagram, and then I'm also on LinkedIn, and this is my website, thezendata.com. All right, so let's get started here. And um, I wanted to share that this uh, will, this is on my Tableau Public page, so if you want to go back, all the directions are in here, you can recreate this. Um, so don't worry if you, you missed something, and obviously this video will be available, because I am going to go pretty quickly to get through them all. All right, so let's get fired up. So um, we're gonna start with going through um, these 10 tricks. I'm just gonna give you a heads up. Also in this actual dashboard, I have little fire icons around and those will indicate where there is um, a link uh, to a resource or something like that that you can go and access. Um, okay, so I'm gonna cover a couple tips. We're gonna go over landing page images and how to use those uh, appropriately and effectively blank character navigation, um, how to use containers, uh, custom formatting with characters, uh, indicator bars, which is a type of chart, uh, floating bar charts, another type of chart, uh, a sheet swap for like a button, uh, a header image, fancy tables, and a return to page, which is how to get someone um, essentially with a navigation from two dashboards to one and how to get back to the one you came from which is a pretty cool one. All right, so let's get started. And I apologize that my camera, I look here, but um, my screen's over here. So uh, if you're looking at my, my video, uh, I am paying attention to you all. I just have to look at my big screen. All right, so we're gonna get started on landing pages. And this is, uh, or how to create a custom background image. Um, so you'll see here, I have this background image that's super nice and clean. This actually looks very similar to something I did design for a client. Um, aside from the colors and the particular image, it looks pretty much just like this. And you'll see I have some um, 
navigation buttons up here. And if I put this into presentation real quick, you will see these are the buttons and I can click um, on these buttons and go back. So that's what we're gonna talk about right now. All right, so uh, if you've never used a background image before, they can be really useful. There's one uh, con to that is that it needs to be tiled in the background, which means everything else should be floated or at least um, uh, tiled within one floating container on top. Um, so that's the only downside to it, but I'll show you how to do this right. So first we have our, our dashboard right here and we're gonna put in our image. And I'll get rid of this other thing in a moment. So as you know, this pops up, we're gonna pick our image. This seems pretty straightforward. Um, you probably used images before, perhaps in your dashboards. Let's see here. Mm -mm, that's not the one I want. Mm. Where did I put it? Oh, we'll use this one. Not the right one. Okay. So you're going to fit and center your image. Oh, I need to pick a different one. Oh, no, that works. That's the right one. Um, I'll get rid of this. So what you'll see is you think you've gotten it pretty well done. Um, this one fits pretty well because it has the same scale. But what you'll see is there's this white area around the side. Um, so Tableau uh, puts padding around images, and the default padding is always four pixels. So we're gonna to wanna to get rid of that and put that at zero. And you'll think, all right, I've done everything I need to do, but there's still this white area. And that's because the bottom tile that Tableau puts in always has a default pixel of eight. So you have to click, you'll see this blue box around here. You have to get the entire tiled container and then remove that to zero. And now you'll see there are no remaining pixels between the edge of my dashboard uh, and the rest of the canvas and you'll can confirm that by when I select the image it's 1200 by 800 which is exactly the size of my dashboard. The other thing I want to share about creating in the images is I use um, Figma to do this. You can use other tools like uh, Illustrator um, which comes with a fee obviously or PowerPoint. I find Figma really useful because in Figma I can actually select the width and the height of the image as a pixel um, ratio. So that helps me identify exactly what it's going to look like in Tableau and I can make the, the size of the image and the dashboard identical and that helps me uh, make that pixel perfect. I find that it's a little more difficult in something like PowerPoint where you can't really get those, uh, you know, type in the exact pixels. So this works really well. Okay. The next is, blend. oh, and uh, one other thing. If you didn't know that you could float objects off to the side of the dashboard like this, you can. Um, so the way to do that, just wanna show real quick as a bonus tip, uh, you cannot drag things off because it completely leaves your canvas area. However, you can drag one side and then drag the other side. And once it's out here, you can make it bigger and smaller. You can't actually move it but you can move it this way. And so that's really great if you wanna put notes to yourself on the side as you're building something or have certain comments you need to follow up on with a client, great place to put some like just notes in the, in the side. So I think that's pretty cool. All right, tip number two is blank character navigation. And so if you're familiar with navigation buttons um, and I will show you how I do this. So I'm gonna, oops drag out a floating horizontal container here. So as you see, this is an image in the background. And I like to do this because then I can customize kind of how my buttons look, but I don't have to bring in images into Tableau, like multiple images. I only need one background image. So I'll drag um, my container out here and then put in my navigation button. Now with navigation buttons, you have two options. Um, you have text buttons and uh, image buttons. So you may think, well, I can just either do an image or I can um, you know, use a blank shape. So sometimes people use an image button and put in a blank or a transparent shape so you can't see it. I wanna show you why I think this is a better alternative. So in um, my IronViz from 
last year, I actually used this. So you'll see I have navigation buttons that are blank, but you see that like, you know, opaque square. Um, because of the shape, it like highlights the square, which I find super annoying. Um, so I don't like that. <laughs> and it might be a little detail, but I've had clients question these things. Um, so the way to go around this is actually to use an em empty character. And a character, um, I will just copy it. So emptycharacter.com has an empty character. And so you can copy and paste this character. Now a character is just like an emoji, right? So every type of character, a Unicode character, an emoji character um, actually has um, a number of characters. So when I paste this in, it says I've used five out of 80 characters. So this blank character, is five, um, you know, things. So anyway, I paste that into here. Now you can't use spaces because I've tried that. It doesn't hold, it doesn't work. You actually have to have something that is uh, a character. So I put in this blank character um, and now I have this navigation button. So what you'll see, I'm just gonna put this here for now, is now I have this blank character button and I'll just put it over overview and you'll see it's right here. And again, I get a different experience than that gray box. I do get it. It does highlight, right? I, it does get a square around it, but it doesn't get that highlighted opaque box. So now I have my um, overview button that I can just get back to. So I think that's pretty sweet. And um, so you can have a lot of fun and creativity with one background image and then these blank character navigations. Okay. All right, the next couple uh, tips I'm going to do is um, custom formatting. So that is using these kind of up down characters without any calculations. You can do it with calculations, but this is a way to do it without them, which is faster. Uh, how to use containers. So you often may see on Tableau Public, people are doing these background images. I want to also provide an alternative because sometimes that is um, either not appropriate or you can't do it or what have you. And so this is all done with containers, even some, you know, faux shadowing that you can see. And I'll show you how to do that. Indicator bars, which is essentially this bar right here, which is um, data instead. So you'll see, um, if I can pick a, so you'll see how that turned red. So essentially what it does is you use um, data-driven pre-attentive attributes but what looks like a title. And so these are indicator bars that um, allow you to provide quick insights to your client to say, hey, look here, there's something wrong. This is okay, right? And you can set those. So I'll show you how to do that. Uh, floating bar charts, that is this right here where we have this floating bar with our points on it. And then we have our, sh our map swap button, which is essentially a button that will swap through various um, sheets. All right, so let's get going with custom formatting. Okay, so in um, we have a worksheet here and I have year of order date and sum of sales, pretty simple. But what I want to do is be able to uh, indicate if something, you know, do a percent difference uh, year over year, um, which you saw over here where I have the year over year change. And I just want to have that with my above or below if something has changed above or below the year before. So first I'll do my uh, table calculation and just do percent difference. So, um, and let me pick a, let me go back to the consumer. Leave this home office. Um, there we go. All right, so I have my year over year difference. So I know this has increased 51% from 2019. So one of the ways to do this is that if I want to, I can um, select format on my window, uh, my table calculation. And so within here, what you'll see is I did went to my formatting pane and under numbers, it's doing an automatic, right? It already knows it's a percentage. If I check out my percentages, right, I can do all these things. There's also custom. Now, custom formatting will so uh, allow you to change um, how you want positive, negative, and zero values to show up. And so what I do is on my computer, I have a little flag up here and a show emoji and symbols. 
Um, there's other places online, you can go to websites and, you know, copy paste these things. So I have my up and down um, arrows. And so I'm going to place those into here in my custom formatting. And just for sake of time, I'm just going to copy them from here. But So you'll see you have uh, the first is positive, then how you want a negative value to respond, and then zeros. So you'll see even if I put in a, a negative here, that shows up and, you know, I can get rid of that. Okay, so now I have my custom formatting. Um, and then the bonus tip here is that if you want to, right now, I just want to show 2020. Uh, if I filter just for 2020, oops, wrong one. You'll see that I get nothing because all the other values have been excluded. So another, you can do um, where you hide the other ones, but I don't really like to do that because it's not really dynamic and it's kind of like hidden information that you didn't, you don't know is still there. So what we have instead is a great little trick that I learned from Kevin Fleurledge and I think he learned from somebody else as as it usually goes. Uh, using this lookup, um, which is pretty interesting, you look up zero, which means you're really looking up the actual value, but it does this fun trick. So if I put this just for 2020, it actually maintains that table calculation. Um, I, uh, I can hide this. And so now I have my uh, year over year for 2020 as 51% above the prior year. Now this custom formatting, as you kind of may have seen, you can also add in your different emojis or characters if you want to really like jazz it up with this custom formatting. And it makes it really easy versus writing a calculation to say if above, then this, if below, then this. So, all right, cool. Tip number four is containers. And so, as you saw um, there, I, I love containers. So, even when I do an image in the background, I will always make one container that I still put everything in as if I wasn't floating anything. Um, so here I have my header image and here's my blank area where I'm going to show you how to create um, this container. Okay. And as you may have seen, what I want to have is these four uh, boxes and within even this one, you'll see there's a bunch of containers even in here. All these are containers. Once you get the hang of it, it's actually pretty simple. All right. So I'm first going to put a container in the background that I am going to color light gray. And with many um, of the um, dashboards I do, I like to add a little bit of padding. So right now I have no padding because I already removed it earlier um, from my like full, from my full container. So I wanna add some back in. So I'm gonna add in 25 all around to give it just some white space, just a little bit of margin. Uh, I play with margins quite frequently. All right, now this might be like watching paint dry because it's going to get a little boring here for a second, but I'm going to drop in a blank container and you can't even see it. We're going to make it white and we're going to remove all padding. And this is actually going to be kind of my middle area, actually. And then I'm going to drop in a horizontal on top and one below. So you start to see how this is already coming together. And then we're going to put in, do you wanna, yeah, I gotta remove padding from these. Oh, they don't have any, good. All right, so then I'm gonna put another blank in here and this one I'm gonna make white. And I'll remove all padding from that. And then I'm gonna put a blank one in the bottom one and also make that white. All padding. All right, so it looks like nothing here, but I, I do. I'll put another one on this side, put another one on this side. You can see one on this side and one on oops, no, that's not right. One on this side and one on this side. There we go. So you can see I start to have what I'm looking for. Um, so then I'm gonna add these borders and make them white. And I'm gonna add just padding, inner padding on the top and bottom, or sorry, the left and right. There we go, left, right and bottom, there we go. 
All right, so I'll do that again. So make this one white, give it a border and change my, no, <laughs> wrong background color. Uh, there we go. And so all this is doing is you'll see, I have all these kind of containers layered in um, and it's just really playing a lot with this padding where I can have things below shine through essentially. And there you have it. So I know that was kind of a lot, but it kind of gives you a sense of how you can play with containers um, and use these to make, you know, your tiled um, sections for uh, a chart or dashboard. Okay, tip number five, indicator bars. So again, that is basically this, where we're gonna try to use some type of header information um, for, uh, indicating that someone needs to, you know, this is good, this is bad, basically. And do I have, I think I have an example somewhere too. Um, we had actually done this for a client where you'll see here, here's an indicator bar and it's like below the, the KPI. So this is like bad, good, uh, what have you. So that's how we can use it in various different ways. It doesn't have to be in this kind of title format. It could literally just be a bar. Um, in this case, I'm using the example of kind of more of a, a title. But either way, the trick is the same. Okay, so the first thing you want to do here is, if you didn't know, you can just double click up on the rows or column shelf and type in calculations that you maybe don't need to save. So we're going to type in in one. Uh, right there. And this is just to give us the data point that we need to create this indicator bar. Um, we actually don't need an axis for this. All we really need is something to be able to change color. So this gives us our bar pretty quickly. Now we're going to edit this axis to be just zero to one because we want to fill the whole space. And you'll format this and remove all of the lines and stuff, which I've already done, uh, and remove the header. Now what we want to have next is a blank calculation and a blank calculation is just open quotes. And this allows us to put something on labels, even though we have nothing we necessarily want to put on labels. So now that there's something that's a text here, Tableau gives us the opportunity to type whatever we want. So let's just say this is, um, let's make this up. Sales. So we can make this, uh, you know, nice and big and white and put that there. Uh, and actually let's add some spaces so it's not right, in, right up against it. Um, so there we go. So we can have our indicator bar with whatever title we want on this bar um, if we wanted to. Uh, the other thing is if you wanted to have something where you're putting perhaps, uh, in my example, the, uh, segment on here, I can put that on here too. Um, what I, just as a bonus tip, if you've never um, also modified using upper and lower, I want this all be caps. And so my segment is not caps. So if I can double click on segment and just type in upper real quick. And that will adjust my title. So now I can say monthly sales home office and get that in there uh, nice and clean. Uh, and then what all you need to do is have some calculation that indicates color. And so the color can be whatever makes sense for you or your client. In this case, I'm just gonna say something that's above or below our average monthly sales. So I have um, already created that calculation here and you'll see uh, the calculation isn't necessarily important here, but you're going to want to say something that, in this case, I'm saying if the selected month, uh, then we're going to have sales show up. And if that value is less than or equal to our, our average monthly sales, uh, if it's less than that, then it's below. Otherwise, it's above. Okay. And so you just have to have something that's whatever your maybe it's a target. Uh, you know, maybe it's some goal or what have you. Maybe it's just an average, whatever. You're just going to want to have some calculation that gives you that in indication. And you can see now how uh, that can change. Of course, these are probably all going to be red, <laughs> whatever I selected there. Um, 
Okay, so that is the indicator bars. I think. Yep. Oh, and I will say one other thing about that is when I put this in here, because I wanted it to kind of look like a tab or like this little, you know, flag off to the side, uh, you'll see I use padding again here. And this is another just bonus tip. So what I've done is I've added 150 pixels of inner padding to get this to kind of end right here. Cause I wanted, I didn't want to fill up the whole space. It wasn't necessary. I thought this looked nicer. So you can also use padding to do that where you can move some of your charts over uh, as you see fit. Okay. Next up is floating bars. So we, I use this a lot. I'm going to show you, uh, another example of this. You'll see that right here. Um, this is for my workplace where we did, um, uh, a percentile, the 25th to 75th percentile, we have the median, and then we have the value of the selected state in this case. And so we do this a lot where you have other data points in the background and then something that is just selected. And so this we call kind of our floating bar that shows some range. Um, I did that again here, another again floating bar, here's the range of something and then having your point in between. So I love these, they're kind of one of my favorites. Uh, okay, so the way we do this is we need, in order to create the bar first, um, we need to have some data point of a range, a starting point and then a range. So in this case, what we're doing here is I'm looking at my um, monthly profit range. So over the course of a year, I wanna know the lowest month's profit, and the highest month's profit, and that is my range, right? And so here's like sales, here's my lowest month, and here's my highest month, and then we have our range. So we need to have a calculation that gets us both our minimum and our maximum values. So you'll see here, um, now I have some LODs to, to do this, but I have my minimum, um, the minimum month, that has the lowest amount of sales. And then I also do my maximum, which is the same thing with a max in here. And again, the data may not, I kind of went a little overboard with doing something that needed LODs. Yours definitely do not have to at all. Um, but you just need a minimum and then a range. And the only way to get the range is to have the minimum and the maximum so you can create the final calculation, which is your maximum minus your minimum. And that gives us that distance between. Okay. Um, all right. So what we want to do is we're going to put, um, I guess we're going to do for profit. So I've wrote it here. So we're going to do profit. And then we're going to do our minimum profit. Okay. So actually, first, I'm going to show you this one. So here's our minimum profit. So I have my minimum on here. I'm going to change this to a Gantt bar and you'll see here's my minimum profit. So right now this is the month with the minimum value, uh, but I want it to be this range. So in order to do that, I'm going to take my profit min max and put that on size. And what you'll see now is that it goes from my minimum value and it takes that distance and just adds that to the size of the Gantt bar. Um, so I don't actually need the maximum out here because that distance or that um, difference will give me that value. So now I have that and I've already formatted the color in the background to this. Um, and then what we want to do is have the dots on top. And so you could have something where you just have one dot. In this case, I want to have all of the values by month. So I'll put some of profit up here and I don't want it to be a Gantt. I want this one to be the circle. But in order to get all of the parts, I need to have my level of detail, which is going to be the month of order date. So I can put this in here and we're going to do month and I have all of my months here. Make this a little smaller. Oops. There we go. Um, so now I have all my months. So you see April through it, here's all my months. And then I do a dual axis. And we're going to make sure we synchronize those axes and we're going to bring the profit to the front. We want those on top. We'll make them a little smaller. And we can take off our measure names because I don't need that on there. I already have colors for them. And select the month. Should have 
in here. Here, there we go. Okay. Um, no. There we go. I just put my selected months on there. Okay, so there we have it. So there's my selected months, and I can just hide these headers. I don't need those for right now. I just probably want the bottom one. Uh, so there I have my range and then my individual. So the key is just having. Again, that range and then putting your level detail on here. Now, if I just wanted my, um, you know, one dot, I, I could have done that as well. All right, so that's the floating bars. The next is the swap button. And so I want to show two examples of that real quick. The first is pretty much where this came from. Uh, this is a viz we did, um, I did with Health Data Viz in collaboration with the Urban Institute. Uh, looking at vaccination rates in the United States. Uh, and so you'll see here, we have this change map type button. Um, and this provides, sorry, it's gonna reload, uh, provides basically a cyclical um, selection. So I click the button, it goes to the next selection, which is the tile map or hex map. And then I click it again, and it brings me back to um, the regular geographical map. Um, what I like about this solution, um, yes, it's great for just regular old sheet swapping, but here's an example where it's actually three things. So I'm going to cycle through three different filters, for example. So here is uh, Superstore. So we have furniture. I click to view office supplies. It'll now change the view to office supplies. I'm sorry, it reloaded. Click it again for technology. I keep clicking the same button and it just cycles through. It's not. Um, You'll see it just it keeps going through in the order that I've told it to. Um, so the same uh, approach can be used for either kind of concept. I'm going to show the map approach because it's just the two things and it's what I have here. But you can check out either dashboard for those. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a parameter. In this case, these are all parameter driven. So we have our um, our parameter that has our geographic and our hex map values. And this is just a string parameter. Then um, we're going to create another ca a calculation. We have two calculations, map type and next map type. Map type is just the value of the current parameter. Um, so it'll just return whatever the parameter is currently selected at. And we want that um, for both the tooltips and um, you know, uh, the shape. And then we have a next map type. And this is the calculation uh, that you can use. It gives a cyc cyclical uh, changing of the parameter value. So we're going to say, you know, when uh, when the map type, you know, case map type, um, which again is just that param, um, just the value of whatever is in the parameter. Oops. When it's geographic map, then we want hex map. When it's hex map, then geographic map. And this allows us to click the button, and the parameter is going to change to the next value. And this is the same thing if you had a third one. So if we had hex map, then uh, chart, you know, and then, you know, when chart, then geographic, right? Like, so that's how you would do three of them is you would just keep going uh, and they would cycle through. So that's kind of the key to this. Um, so here we're going to put our map type on detail. And then we're going to put next map. Let's make this hold on. Yeah. Next map type on shape. And so I want that in here because I want to be able to say, you know, this is you're currently on this and your next map is this, right? Okay. And then um, what we'll do, so now we have our button that essentially I've already hooked up for my shapes. When we put it back in to our view, the parameter action is what's going to drive this. So we just have our, both of our calculations on there. That's pretty much all I've done so far. Okay. So in here, I have my um, a container and you need a container for anything in this example where I'm actually using two different sheets that are swapping out. The other example uh, is not using sheet swapping. That's a, a filtering um, mechanism. So it's a little different. Um, okay, so I'm going to put in my 
sales map and oh my hex one must already be in here somewhere oh it's already in here so it's last um and with any um swapping of sheets you do have to hide the title the titles don't collapse in your container you also need to have these in a container for them to collapse which is again why i'm pro containers uh okay so then we're going to bring out our button um so float this out here okay so now i have my button here all right so in order to hook this up we're going to go to dashboard actions and this is where we're going to add our action and it's going to change parameter now the only sheet you need to have this on is my swap button the parameter is my map type and the target field is the next map type and i don't need aggregation i don't need anything else but that's all it is so it's saying you know when this parameter i'm going to tar i'm going to target that calculation that calculation is going to trigger the change of the parameter so you'll see when i select it it triggers the change of that parameter to the next value that i have in that calculation so this is kind of a way you can do for multiple different charts. So if you want someone to look through scatterplot, bar chart, line chart, you can use one button to say, hey, you're gonna go through them in this order versus you know, select something. All right. Uh, the next one is um, kind of what I'm calling a fancy table. So this is essentially what I wanna get across is the ability to use one uh, one worksheet for multiple chart types in sort of a table that incorporates different uh, charts as well. And so the benefit is, in this case, I can scroll. I don't have multiple worksheets for the bar chart, for the text, for this other kind of um, pill thing I've got going on. And so I want to show you how you can utilize this technique, um, probably for a number of different things. Um, I'm trying to think if I had an, I don't think I had an example of this. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is, uh, in my example, I, I want to have both some other information in text. So I have first order date here. I also want to have this more of a customized text field where I have two different values, two different metrics kind of on top of each other, one main one and one for context. And then some sort of indicator to say how this per, you know, these uh, customers are performing. And then we have our general bar charts. All right, so I've already put the bar charts out here. We have um, average sales per order and sum of sales. Obviously, this is super store data. Um, and I have changed some of the formatting so that this looks like a hyperlink because later I will show you we're going to use this um, for our drill down tables. Okay, um, so what I want to have first is that first order date that I want to have in the front. Now, you'll know that you can definitely put first order date here and make an exact date and you can make it a discrete value uh right and then it becomes like this text in the front totally fine you can do that what you can't do with discrete value texts is get uh this kind of um, information where you have two different metrics in one space the other thing is that when you have something that's actually uh, data on an axis, you can then add in tooltips. So you can have more flexibility in additional information you may add into this. So first order date, maybe you want to have values in here to show, um, you know, the sales of their first order or something like that. Uh, then you could do that. You cannot do that in this alternative. All right, so I'm going to take that off because I'm not actually going to do it that way. All right, so what we're gonna do instead is we're right on here, gonna type min zero, oops. I'm gonna put that in front. All right, so the way Tableau does this is any type of metric out here, you're going to get an axis, right? And there's a lot of flexibility of things you can do in Tableau once you create an axis. Um, so here, now that I just have this pretend axes, I can put information on it. So I'm going to put my first order date on the label here. 
going to make this my exact date. And we're going to center this. And we're going to make it right a circle, change the size to as tiny as it can be, and change the opacity to zero. So essentially, you don't see it anymore. Actually, I want to. I guess I want to let the line these. Um, okay. So there I have my um, first order date. Okay. The next I want to do is I want to do another one where I have those other two values. So what I want to show this, and the reason I'm showing this is we're going to do min. Um, negative 1.0. Then I'll move this over here. So the reason I'm showing you something that has uh, a point zero is Tableau is going to default your axes to the type of number you type in. So I typed in an integer, I typed in zero. Uh, I actually can't change this axis uh, to a decimal. I couldn't like change it to point from negative point one to point one or something because that's not the type of value I typed in. If I type in zero point zero, then I can. So here I did negative 1.0 on purpose because I want to be able to actually adjust this a little bit. Uh, so again, I'm going to oops, this one again, change this to a circle, change the uh, opacity to zero. And now I'm going to put on my uh, order, distinct order ID. So we're going to do count distinct, and then we're going to do um, sold. And quantity. So now in my labels, I can change this and say, let's see here, I want orders, items sold. Okay. So you'll see now I have this in space here. There we go. Um, but I don't want my axes to look like this. So I can now actually edit this axis and fix this to, let's do, To, let's make this group two card. There we go, it's a little better. Um, and we're going to write along these. Um, we need to make this a circle and Where'd it go? Hang on. I probably did my axes wrong. That an automatic. Okay. There it is. That's fine. Um, okay. So then I have my. Um, items here. And so you can see how now I can add in multiple, uh, plenty of information. And again, you can add in stuff in the tooltip. One of the things that it is worth noting for this method is that uh, Tableau is going to make each column the same width. So this is not going to be very effective if you have an entire dashboard uh, of this size with only like three things. Um, I've used this technique in smaller spaces where I needed a small table in a lower corner. And that way, everything, the text doesn't look like it has too much space. So it's just something to consider. Um, but the last thing we're going to do is add in this other um, pill thing. And we can do that now with this um, technique. Um, okay, so now we're going to, what we need to do is create um, this pill, which is essentially connecting uh, two points. And so we're going to put on measure values up here. Now, measure values. 
uh, I already have, it's kind of already default is what I have. Measure values tend to put on everything, right? So let me, it'll put on everything you have usually. And all you need to do is remove everything. So yeah, I would remove all of this stuff, just throw that off to the side and type in, you know, min zero before I get rid of everything and min one. And then get rid of everything else. And sorry, so now, I, oops, one more, there we go. Now I have uh, these two values. And once I have that, I will take measure names and put that, and we're gonna make this a line first. And put measure names on path. So this connects the two values that I've just created. I'm gonna move measure values over here. Um, <clears throat> so it's just now connecting the zero and the one, which are the two values that I've put uh, into my measure values um, marks card here. Uh, so now that I have that, what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna duplicate it. Let me make this big first. Make this one the fat one. There we go. And I think I need to add, so here's where you can edit your axes a little bit. Um, I don't want this to look this weird. So I'll do to one point, let's try. Yeah, uh, maybe even more. So by doing this, I'm actually giving a little bit of space between um, these two axis sections. Um, so now I have this fat line essentially. And so I'm gonna duplicate this. Let's try that again. Yeah. There we go. Uh, and I'm gonna dual axis it with measure values. And so now I have these two, of course this changed. I hate when it breaks your other ones. Uh, okay, so there's my bars. We're back. All right, so we have these. We're going to make sure these are synced. All right, so my second measure values, I'm also going to make a line. And I want measure names still on path. But the trick here is to make one smaller, just ever so slightly smaller than the other. Now, let me add color here so you can actually see what's going on because. Um, Let's see. All right, so let's just add this on so you can see what the heck's going on here. So we'll put one of these on color. There we go. And then the second one, so now I can see my other line. So I'm going to make this um, just big enough that I get a line. See how now it looks like there's this line between them. I'm going to add my other color on here. And now you'll see that difference. So I've created this pill that essentially is, uh, and the reason I have two different calculations which are identical is just for the color because you can't adjust the color in one and not the other. Um, and I don't want it to be opaque necessarily because the background will still show through. I actually want to just change the color to look like it's opaque. Uh, so now I have my, um, my indicator, so you'll see here. And then of course I can add text onto here um, where I can actually put this on label and uh, make that nice and centered in here and just on. There we go. Just on the start of the line. There we go. So I'll do something like that and play around with some of the formatting to get my table. But the bottom line is anything with that min one, min zero. You can do a lot of things with trying to create axes. Um, I've seen people even make strangely enough crazy like some line charts in here which is a little trickier uh we've done this before with some other techniques with being able to um, do some distributions by putting you know let's say it's age like zero to 20 it gets axes value one you know 20 to 40 gets two 40 to 60 gets three and 60 plus gets four and once you bucket them into axes then you can actually um plot like a distribution along the same kind of uh, chart okay and the last one I've got is the return to page. And so let me show you how this works. So this came up with a client 
Um, it's kind of a particular use case, but I think there's a lot of value in understanding the concept. Uh, so this is when you have, let's say, a drill down report that uh, has some details. So in this example, I'll click on a state, and it's going to take me to a customer detail page now for the state I've selected. So once someone's on a detail page, whether it's a table or just some other uh, dashboard, you know you want your user to feel um, that all of this navigation makes sense. So when I go back, I expect to go back to where I started from. So I started on the page, this page. So I press return, I get there. Now let's say I'm on my customer table and I want to click on a single customer. I want the same, I want to use the same detail page because I don't need to build it twice. It's the same information. Um, it's just based on how it's aggregated, but it's the same view. Well, again, I want my user to be able to say, well, I came here from the customer table. When I press return, I expect to go back to the customer table. So you'll see uh, my details. I have one sheet, but, and one, you know, what looks like one button, but they go back to two different places. So how is this done? So the trick here is um, parameter actions and two worksheets. So we're first gonna create a return to customer sheet and a return to overview sheet. And those are our two sheets that are gonna uh, make this work. Um, so what we need to do <clears throat> is I have, now that's, this is only because I have two sheets. So I have a Boolean parameter that has two values of true or false, um, right? So I just made a Boolean, true, false. Then I created literally a true and a false calculation. So here's one for true. I just type true in it. The other one says false. Now, if you recall, the way to use parameters is you have to have some calculation uh, that the parameter action is going to trigger. And also that those calculations need to be on the worksheets um, that you're utilizing. So in this case, um, I have a return to customers. So my return to customers, I have put true on here. And I have put my blank calculation up here. The reason I've done that is because I want this worksheet to collapse. And in order for it to collapse, it has to have some uh, something on like my rows or columns um, to make Tableau do that. All right, so, and then I have my true here. Um, I actually have a shape and my shape is a blank shape. So this is a place where I am using a blank or a transparent shape uh, so that therefore you can't see it and you can't click on it because I want the worksheet to essentially be blank. It's only used to for the navigation. All right, and then we have our return button. And this is just our parameter because remember, we need a parameter, we need calculations, and we need the calculations to be on the worksheet. Okay, and so I've done the same thing for this one, the return to overview, except for this one is false. So I put my false calculation on here. That's essentially all it is. On my details page, so this is the page that you want people to uh, click to get back to something. What we've done is taken uh, a container in here, and you'll see in my layout, I can show you. There are those two worksheets I've put in this vertical container. Now, my return button, true, I put that on uh, my filters because I this is kind of like a sheet swap. I only want it to show up when the parameter is true. And for the other one, I only want it to show up when the parameter is false. So here I put my return button a calculation and set it to true. And on this one, I set it to false. So you'll see on my details, my return, oops, sorry. My return to overview one is squashed down because it doesn't have any data because it's now false. And so only one shows up. On my dashboard actions, all I need here is uh, a go-to sheet navigation. So this is a go-to sheet action where I've said on the return to customers, when you hit it, you're going to go to the customer's table. And the other one is obviously the opposite. Um, when you click that worksheet, it goes to the overview table or dashboard. But you'll see only one is ever present at a time. Okay, so I can only ever go back to the one that's um, there. Now, the way to do this, though, is I have to have something to change that parameter, and that is going to be driven on the dashboard that you start from, right? So the customer's table is going to make that parameter for the customer's worksheet true, right? It's going to trigger the parameter to change. 
So on this dashboard, on my actions, I have parameter. And so here I have my table, which is this one. It could be, you could use a button if you wanted to or whatever. My return parameter, uh, um, return parameter, parameter. And then my field is true. So this is saying, hey, when this selected, I'm gonna change the return parameter to true. Okay, so when I click this, it goes true. And that goes here, which brings my return to customers um, worksheet. It made that one true, the other one false. Same with on the, go back, the overview. I'll add on this dashboard, my actions, return to overview. Uh, sorry. Wrong parameter. Oh, no, it is. It's on, yeah, it's on either of these maps. I want you to be able to select either map, uh, return parameter, and it's false. So again, when I click the worksheet, it triggers this parameter and changes the value to false. And when it changes to false, those, um, I'm sorry, I got to do this correctly. Um, one of the things that is an issue with this is you can't uh, navigate back. You do have to navigate from the actual place you were because it'll, they'll overwrite each other essentially. Um, so you have to use the navigation buttons, not the tabs. Um, okay, so then again, so when I select this, it's going to change those um, worksheets. And now my return to overview, again, is now set to false. That's what is triggered and the true one doesn't exist anymore and disappears. And so that is how you returned. You can go to one place and return to where you came from. I know that's a little complicated, but uh, I think it's pretty cool. And um, we're just about out of time. And so that's it. And thank you so much for having me. I hope these things prove to be valuable. Um, and I do have some blog posts about some of these uh, tips and tricks, but also, like I said, you can download the workbook and kind of look through it as you wish. And thanks so much. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you for sharing with those tips and tricks. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. Perfect. I have just one question for you and Ralph is asking, uh, he's just thanking you for the presentation and he is asking you in terms of how you make an assessment of how a dashboard will perform before decide, deciding what visuals you create. Anything you want to talk about that? So how a dashboard will perform? Yep. So repeat the question one more time. So, so the question is that how you make an assessment, how a dashboard will perform before deciding what visuals to create. Mm. Yeah, so, you know, it's interesting to kind of think of it that way. Um, in terms of performance before you make the visuals. So, I mean, most of these things are going to perform pretty well. I mean, there are certain things that will inhibit performance obviously certain types of calculations obviously very large images some of those things can slow down performance um, but i tend to actually look more at my client or my audience in terms of their use like how they're going to use the dashboard and i want to make sure that things are very user friendly and uh, easy to access easy to click through that makes sense and so i really think more about that instead of necessarily performance. Um, I guess it's kind of the same, but if you're talking about Tableau being slow or something, um, sometimes I think about that while I'm designing or if I'm noticing it's going to be, you know, too much of a load on Tableau. But really more of my focus is user experience and making sure that um, things are really intuitive, particularly with a lot of this navigation um, type of stuff, as well as like easy to interpret. So those, you know, header bars, like things like that, like these are pretty obvious things for folks. People are going to tend to understand, um, you know, what some of these pre attributes mean or um, things like that. So I tend to look at that first um, when I'm designing things and thinking through what's going to make it easiest for the client. Um, so, I, yeah, I don't know if that answers the question, but in terms of performance, I tend to do that, like, kind of on the fly as we're building it. If I notice things are not, you know, going to be as performant, then I come up with a different solution, I suppose. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay, for that. And I have just one last question. What has been the impact of Tableau community and Tableau public in your journey? So it's been huge. Uh, it's probably no surprise. Um, 
for many. Uh, I've been using Tableau since 2014, but I didn't um, get involved with the Tableau community until about 2018. So it took me a number of years to figure out kind of it was even there, which is interesting because once uh, you're involved in the community, you can't imagine living without those folks. Um, but, you know, it's in terms of my growth, I couldn't have done it without other people sharing their knowledge, right? Like you can only do so much in a vacuum on your own and certainly you can learn very much just by tinkering around um, by yourself. But there's really something to be said about how much you can advance when you're, you know, utilizing people's blogs. You're reaching out to someone and say, "How do you do this? I need help." Right? Um, you're watching things um, like these BizConnect presentations where you can get a wide variety of information from people. So, without the community putting out that information and helping others, I, I don't think I would have advanced so quickly in my Tableau skills. It probably would have taken me a lot longer. I started participating in things like Makeover Monday um, earlier on, and that helped jumpstart me understanding a lot more in Tableau than I knew initially. Uh, I don't participate in that anymore because I think there's always comes a, an ebb and flow in your life of what you need to do and where you are in your career or your you know, skill set. But definitely being involved in the community, seeing what people publish, that helps drive creativity for me. Um, I mean, I literally have this book next to my desk because I'm kind of reading through it again. But the steel like an artist, I mean, you don't uh, I don't get a lot of creative juices unless I'm really seeing what people are doing. And then I can think through more creatively on my own or come up with a solution um, that maybe I, I figure out on my own. But a lot of that is jump started from just being involved in the community and seeing what amazing things people are doing. Thank and you, I Lindsay. One I other think question. Please, please, go ahead. please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So how do I come up with my rough dashboard designs before actually building? Um, so that's a great question. I use Figma currently um, to create things. Um, and so for folks who haven't used it, I'm a huge fan of it. It's you know a free you can, there's a free version obviously that's um, on the web. And so in here, I'll often, um, you know, build things. You'll see, like, this is something, this is all just in Figma. I don't know what else I have in here, right? Like, who knows? Um, yeah, so here's some, like, background designs that I've done. This, this is even, this is Josh Hughes. And I was like, I'm going to totally, like, this is an image. This is how I get some image ideas, and then I try to build something. Um, so I use Figma a lot. Um, to kind of build these background ideas um, or like entire entire um, entire dashboards, you know, this is all built in Figma actually, um, where we'll I'll design it here. I'm not as good at paper and pencil, so I like to actually be able to create charts, add color, really make it almost pixel perfect. Uh, it gives me a lot of opportunity to um, play around and think through, um, you know, what I'm going to. Create. Oh, sorry. I'm like showing my screen as if you can see it. You totally can't see my screen. <laughs> um, I probably should have really showed that. Um, but anyway, so a Figma is really great for. Um, let me see if I can. I'll share it real quick, just because it's probably helpful. But yeah, that that is how I do a lot of my uh, my work. Is here we go. So sorry, I was showing this. So this this dashboard example is actually done in Figma. This happens to be an image of it, but it is done in Figma, and that helped develop kind of the framework for how we wanted to lay things out. Um, you know, all of these. Let's see here. So what I was saying is, you know, I can prototype something in Figma entirely, um, and even in this particular example, I could even. Um, uh, prototype how it looks. So you can prototype in Figma and actually view if I select this, this is what it's going to look like for the client. If I select this, this is what's going to happen. And I find that really valuable for client work. And then um, also, again, just I can be a lot more creative um, in a tool where I can draw charts and graphs and containers and things that are going to actually happen in Tableau. I'm not as good at drawing it out. Some people are really good at drawing on paper. That's just that would take me forever. So, and again, I often do look even for business dashboards. I look for ideas um, on Dribble, um, uh, Pinterest, Tableau Public, just to get an idea of, um, you know, a, a layout or 
um, some other technique, color schemes, things like that, if, if I have the opportunity to be very creative. So I do a lot of that even with client work. Perfect. Thank you, Lindsay. You're welcome. There is one last question from Haley, and she is asking, how do you deal with the pressure that your vis should be better than before? That your vis should be what? Better than before. Oh, like continually making better visits than the one previous. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Um, so I would say don't, <laughs> uh, you know, there, there is a reality of always wanting to improve. And I, and I feel that too, very fre frequently, you know, looking back, even at, um, client visits or personal visits from a year ago, I may cringe when I look at them and say, oh, I could have done so much better now. Um, so I don't know if it's necessarily doing something better every time. What I do try to do is do something new every time. Now, new doesn't mean better. It just means I'm going to try either a different skill or I'm going to, uh, you know, it's going to look different. I, better might not be the right word for it. But, you know, for me, it's more about improving my skills, my understanding of client needs, my ability to, um, you know, tighten up my user experience um, or that, you know, interactivity. Um, so I just try to do something that's different each time or, or new, uh, but don't put too much pressure on yourself. I mean, honestly, you know, I, I was looking at recent iron viz um, visualizations and there are some that will blow you out of the water. There are others that you're like, this is amazing, <laughs> gorgeous, and yet is very simple, right? So it's not always about necessarily better um, or more complicated, but um, just that you felt that you've learned something, I think is the best thing you can do each time. Perfect. I think with that, uh, thank you, Lindsay. It was an honor to have you back on Disconnect. And thank you for sharing your knowledge, tips and tricks, and motivating everyone in the community to go ahead and participate more on Tableau community programs and also to go ahead and challenge yourself. So thank you for that. Thank you so much. So I think have with that, thank you everyone for joining. Yeah, have a great weekend. Take care and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.